Thank you so much for joining us this morning. This is the third of six webinars that we'll be introducing and sharing highlights of the 2022 statistical report for the Hawaii State Plan for a data-driven system of care on substance use. This webinar will be focused on chapter six, looking at the intersection between substance use and criminal justice, and chapter seven, looking at the intersection between substance use and juvenile justice. My name is Devro Talangi, and I will be your facilitator for this webinar. Before we get started with our presentation, uh, as usual, I would like to give a few housekeeping reminders. First, this is a Zoom webinar event, which means that you, our audience, are able to see us, the panelists, but we cannot see you. There are two ways to interact with us and between yourselves. The, third, the first is through the chat window, which you should be able to see on the Zoom status bar. The second is through the questions and answers window, <clears throat> which you should also be able to access through the Zoom status bar. We encourage you to post questions and comments, as well as to introduce yourselves, uh, as it will help make the webinar more interactive and add to the discussion. Our panel and team will try to answer your questions as they arise. However, we also do have time allocated for discussion, so our panel may try to answer your questions at that time. There will be four poll questions that will be posted throughout the presentation. There is also a short post webinar survey at the end that will pop up when you leave the Zoom room. Your feedback is very important for improving the webinar series, so please consider spending a minute or two after the webinar ends to fill out the survey. Finally, we will be providing the slide deck with all of the supplementary material, contact information, and links to all our participants after the webinar. A recording of this presentation will also be available next week. The recording for webinar one and webinar two are now available and the link will be provided as well after the webinar. Okay, now I will introduce our panel. Our first panelist is John Valera from the Hawaii Department of Health, Alcohol and Drug Abuse Division. John is the acting administrator of the Alcohol and Drug Abuse Division and in that role is a, is a sponsor for the state plan project. He has served at the ADAD in various capacities since 2016 and is a certified planner with the American Institute of Certified Planners. He has a master's in urban planning from the University of Hawaii and a bachelor of science in planning and public administration from the University of Southern California. Our second panelist is Dr. Jared Uro, also from the Hawaii Department of Health Alcohol and Drug Abuse Division. Jared has a Doctor of Psychology degree from the United States International University, and he completed his Master's in Education at Columbia University and received his Master's in Psychology from the California School of Professional Psychology, San Diego. He is a licensed psychologist, and since 2002, he has worked for the Hawaii Alcohol and Drug Abuse Division, where he serves as Chief Clinical Officer, Clinical Psychologist Supervisor, and currently as Acting Public Health Program Manager. Our third panelist is Jared Redula from the Hawaii Department of Public Safety Narcotics Enforcement Division. Jared is the Administrator of the Hawaii Department of Public Safety Narcotics Enforcement Division, and in this capacity, he is the state's Chief Regulator over Legitimate Controlled Substances Industries. Jared also serves as the state government's chief drug enforcement officer. Jared holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in Sociology from Colorado State University and is a graduate of the 251st session of the FBI National Academy in Quantico, Virginia. Jared is the subject matter expert and lead author of the System of Care chapter of the State Time Project, focused on substance use and criminal justice, which is titled Implications for a System of Care in Hawaii for Criminal Justice and Substance Use. Welcome to our panelists. Due to scheduling conflicts, the chapter author for the System of Care chapter on Substance Use and Juvenile Justice, Dr. Tayan Miao, could not join us this morning. However, we thought that this would be a great opportunity for a member of the state plan team here at the university to join us and help with the presentation of the highlights. Jacqueline Topino is a policy research associate with the Pacific Health Analytics Collaborative, 
and she holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Biology and a Bachelor of Arts degree in Public Health from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Jacqueline has been working with the PHAC, with PHAC since she was a third year undergraduate student and has been with the State Plan Project shortly after it started. As a key member of the State Plan Project, Jacqueline has been assisting with creating the statistical report through generating tables and graphs and compiling the data from various data sources using R and LaTeX. In addition, Jacqueline has assisted with the development of the Hawaii Behavioral Health Dashboard, including the interactive data dashboards created with Power BI. Please welcome Jacqueline. We are very happy to introduce the talent behind the work on this project and I look forward to having more of our team members in the upcoming webinars. Again, my name is Devro Talangi. You can call me Dev. I am the facilitator for today. I am an assistant researcher at the University of Hawaii Manoa, co-principal investigator of the Data Infrastructure Core of the State Bank Project, and the lead author of the 2022 Statistical Report. This presentation is separated into two main parts. First, our panelists will walk you through highlights from chapter six of the report, looking at the intersection between substance use and criminal justice, followed by a short discussion. Then our presenter will walk through the highlights for chapter seven of the report, looking at the intersection between substance use and juvenile justice. Again, this will be followed by a short discussion. Please post any questions you have in the chat for our panelists to answer, and we also do encourage you to post your own answers and comments. We are well aware that many of you in the audience today may be directly involved in these areas, and your feedback is very valuable. Since we only have one hour for each of our webinars, our goal for this webinar series is to introduce and highlight some of the findings from the 2022 report. If you are interested in viewing the current draft version of the full report, a link and password is now being provided to you in the chat window. We noted that there were some issues with copying the links from the chat window in the last webinar. We are very sorry about that. In case we encounter the same technical difficulties today, we sent an email with all of these links to all of our participants right before the webinar started. So please check your email if you are having difficulties. Please note that since this statistical report draft is still in the consultation process. It is a view only version and is not available for download. Alternatively, you can also view the highlights provided in this webinar either in an interactive or infographic format at the Hawaii Behavioral Health Dashboard. The, that link is also being provided to you right now in the chat window and is included in the email that was sent. Before we move on to the chapter highlights, I wanted to give a few reminders about the data sources used in this report. I had addressed these in the previous webinar, but I think for anyone new, some of this context will be helpful. There are 18 data sources that were used for uh, this iteration of the statistical report. They fall into these three general categories. However, some of them do have, have aspects that belong in multiple categories. Each type has its own pros and cons. But the main thing we we're looking for is that the data can be validated either from the source or by us through our own methodology. Some of the key data sets that are used throughout the report include the NUSTA, National Survey for Drug Use and Health, the HCOP hospitalization data, and the Web Infrastructure for Treatment Services, also known as WIPS. These 18 data sources were determined to be the best available um, that we had access to up until the current draft was finalized in February of this year. Many of these data sources are available publicly, but some are only available due to the partners who gave us access to their data. We are aware that there are other data sources which may provide more comprehensive or newer data, but unfortunately, due to various reasons, we do not necessarily have access to that data at this time. The reproducible analytics framework that was built to produce the report will allow us to make updates to the report with fairly minimal effort as the data becomes available. If you would like to know more about the methodology that was employed to produce this report, please do refer to the report itself. Chapter one of the report covers what I went over in much greater detail. If you would like to know more about some of the limitations of each data set, the appendix in the report outlines this information for every data set along with links to further references. 
I will attempt to outline some of these as we go through the sources for each chapter. Okay, now we are moving on to the highlights for chapter six, which is focused on substance use and criminal justice. And we begin with our first poll question, which is, how familiar are you with the criminal justice issues in the state? I will give you a few moments to provide your answer. Okay, thank you. We also have our second short poll question, which is, are you directly involved with providing criminal justice services? Again, I will give you a few moments to provide your answer. Okay, thank you so much. So before I hand it over to our panel to take us through the highlights, um, I will give a brief overview of the chapter. So this chapter is split into two subsections. The first subsection is looking at criminal justice and crime and violence in Hawaii. The primary data sets used for this section this subsection are the Crime in Hawaii Uniform Crime Reports and the National Incident-Based Reporting System. The Crime in Hawaii Reports are part of the Uniform Crime Reporting Program, which is a nationwide system of criminal statistics administered by the FBI. The data used in this subsection is from the Crime in Hawaii October 2021 report, which is the latest in an annual series prepared by the Hawaii Department of the Attorney General. This data is fairly comprehensive and recent. However, however, like many data sets that we use, it does not track individuals, only instances of arrests. The National Incident Reporting System is also part of the Uniform Crime Reporting Program and is publicly available online. Like the Crime and Hawaii Reports, crimes are organized into incidents, not individuals. The next subsection examines criminal justice and substance use treatment services. Three data sets are used for this section. The National Survey for Drug Use and Health data set, the WITS data set, and the Treatment Episodes data set. The NUSA is a large and comprehensive national in-person survey conducted by SAMHSA. The NUSA is publicly available and it has been conducted over several years, which means its methods have been refined. The downsides are that surveys of this side and the size and complexity do have trouble with getting a large enough sample size, especially for smaller states like Hawaii. One of the ways we got around that was to take pool averages of either two, four, or six years rather than individual years. The WITS dataset provides information on clients receiving substance use, abuse treatment services from the Alcohol and Drug Abuse Division of the Hawaii Department of Health. This data is not publicly available and was extracted and compiled by our team with permission from ADAD. A key advantage of the WITS is that it has data about the population in question. However, the WITS is limited to a, limited to a subset of that population. Um, those who get substance use treatment through public funding it does not capture those seeking substance use treatment through private means. Another advantage of the WITS is that we have access to the entire data set and can track individuals. However, there are challenges with the transformation on a compilation of the data. The most recent data extraction was from the last quarter of 2020. The TEDS is a national data set that is publicly available and it compiles data from treatment facilities that receive public funding, like the WITS. Like many clinical data set, the TEDS reports instances of admission and discharges and does not track individuals. The TEDS data, like many national data sets, lags by a few years. In this case, the most recent data is from 2019, which got released in the fourth quarter of last year. This next slide outlines some of which I just went over, but again, if you want more detailed information about each data set, please refer to the appendix of the report itself. Okay. I will now be passing it over to 
John to go over our highlights for this chapter. Hello, everyone. Happy Friday. Uh, it's reached the end of the week again. And uh, uh, my first off, I, I wish you a happy weekend uh, coming up. The, we're taking turns with each of these slides. So I have about four or five, and then I'll pass it on to our, our next presenter. Um, this, these slides here are part uh, of the Crime in Hawaii 2019, which is available on the Attorney General's website. Um, it's pretty elaborate, uh, pretty involved uh, uh, data collection that they're doing for all types of offenses. And this is, we're just looking at the substance use offense subset because uh, the part two offenses uh, cover a wide gamut of different offenses. You know, part one offenses are pretty much your, your ser like super serious offenses like murder and rape and that sort of thing. But uh, whereas part two offenses cover a wide gamut, but this is the substance use offenses uh, that deal with alcohol related, say disorderly conduct, or driving under the influence or, or violations of liquor laws or drug abuse uh, violations pertaining to the unlawful possession, sale, use, the growth or the manufacture or the making of illegal drugs. So that's all part of this, what you see in this slide here. And it shows that from 2010 to 2019, DUI, that dark red line toward, well, no, the not the dark red, the orange line at the top, which stands out, uh, is the most common substance use related part two offense among adult arrests in the state of Hawaii, according to the Attorney General's data set. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Okay, here we have another uh, crime in Hawaii slide. Um, it highlights 2019, um, by comparing males and females uh, shows the number of adult arrests for alcohol related part two offenses in Hawaii was highest among adults aged 18 to 24 uh, for females and males compared to the other age groups. However, I need to add that the age 25 to 29 bracket is not far behind. Next slide, please. Um, this slide all, uh, compares the 18 to 24 year olds. Well, no, it shows that 18 to 24 year old uh, for female adult arrests for drug possession, uh, part two offenses. Um, again, 25 to 29 year old bracket is not far behind, whereas for the male category, the leading age group is age 30 to 34, with the 25 to 29 year olds not far behind. Next. And this is uh, another slide, same data set, which shows the number of arrests for alcohol related part two offenses. Um, and it, it, it's highest among the Caucasians, although the unknown category is also interesting. Um, it's the unknown is part of, apparently it's a, it's a category that's a valid, it is part of the National Incident-Based Reporting System or, or NIBRS. But well, if we knew what that unknown category is. I mean, it suggests, if, if anything, um, uh, si somewhat significant underreporting of the other ethnicities. If we knew what the unknown ethnicities are, were, then we possibly would see uh, greater uh, shifts in each, in the bars for each ethnicity. I want to defer to my colleague, Jared. Euro. Dr. All right. Jared. Thank you very much, John. 
So looking at adult arrests for drug part two offenses in the state by race and ethnicity for 2019. So if we look at the different drug possession offenses, whether we're talking about marijuana, opium or cocaine, synthetic narcotic or non-narcotic, we can see again, the ethnic breakdowns. So looking how it is for whites and looking at Hawaiians and then looking at the fact that really non-narcotic as a large chunk of this, then followed by Filipino, other Pacific Islanders, and then other ethnic categories. We can see that the arrests range anywhere from zero to 800 and then higher. Next slide, please. So looking at also breakdown of the types of drugs found in drug-related cases on Oahu from 2018 to 2020. So in particular, you can see that for amphetamines and cannabis, amphetamines 46.28%, which is really quite high. And then for cannabis, which follows at 36.27%. Other categories include for stimulants, opioids, depressants, hallucinogens, and then there's also an unknown category, which also make up uh, the total. Next slide, please. So looking at treatment admissions by arrests in the past 30 days in the state of Hawaii for the years 2015 to 2019, we can see how it is ranged, um, particularly uh, 6,000. We talk about uh, none as being a very high category. And then over the years from 2015 to 2019, actually getting lower and lower and lower. On the other hand, when we look at some of the other categories, whether we look at two or more times, or are we looking at missing unknown or not collected, invalid? We look at the trend lines as being more towards the bottom in terms of admissions on from 2015 to 2019. Next slide, please. So treatment admissions by detailed criminal justice referral in the state from 2015 to 2019. Please note that when we're looking at the trend line for probation and parole, looking at the number of admissions from zero to 4,000, again, from 2015, 2019, we can look at the trend line. And then we look at the other areas when we talk about state, federal court, other recognized legal entities, prison, DUIs, and others. Um, you look at the very top, we look at um, this area for, I believe it is missing unknown, not collected or invalid, very, very high. But again, the trend line starting very, very high above 4,000 and then a little bit under 2,000 by the time we hit 2019. Next slide, please. And his, this is where we'll open it up to discussion and I'm gonna turn it back to Dev. Thank you so much, uh, John uh, and Jared. Um, so we're now at our discussion portion of this first half of our presentation. And our first discussion question is, um, as a subject matter expert, what are some key highlights on the intersection of substance use and criminal justice that you would like to share with the audience? So this uh, discussion question is primarily um, for our subject matter expert, Jared Radula. And so I will pass it over to, to Jared um, and then our other panel panelists can weigh in as, uh, as necessary. Thank you, Jared. Yeah, hi, uh, good morning. This is uh, Jared Radula and th thanks for having me on the webinar this morning. Uh, you know, in terms of what we just saw in the infographics here, there, there's some really key takeaways about this. Um, you know, the, the first thing that I see is that within all of this data is opportunity. And it's really opportunity for those of us who work in the criminal justice system to try to make a difference. Um, we, we saw early in the infographics slides about numbers of arrests, and we see things like DUI being really high in terms of numbers over the years. Um, but what we also see is that um, treatment referrals resulting from ar arrests are in decline. And that's really, I, I think, um, for me as a, as a criminal justice professional and somebody working 
in law enforcement, that that's really a call to action, I think, for law enforcement to really take advantage of the opportunity presented here that when we go out and confront someone in a criminal case or during a criminal investigation, that we're not just there to lock them up, but rather to exploit the opportunity that we have um, to, whether it's to refer someone to treatment, to perhaps parallel our criminal investigation actions or, or arrest actions with a, a parallel action to try to get someone into treatment as well. So, so really what I see here is, is a lot of opportunity um, to get involved in treatment. Um, some of the other slides that we saw showing um, high amounts of arrests involving methamphetamine and um, marijuana, those aren't surprising. Um, for decades, methamphetamine has been the flavor or the drug of choice in Hawaii. Uh, currently, especially over the last couple of years, it's um, extremely easy to get, very cheap on the streets of Honolulu right now. So it's, it's no um, surprise that there's a lot of methamphetamine arrests in Hawaii. I, th I think the other part of it is that methamphetamine is treated in our drug laws as what is known as a dangerous drug and even mere possession of a small amount um, is a felony offense. And that doesn't give law enforcement professionals a lot of discretion. Um, so generally speaking, you have to arrest somebody. So, uh, you know, I think overall, looking at the material we just saw, it, it isn't surprising. But what it also says is there's opportunity in this, in this, um, in, in the data, and the data shows opportunities for us in criminal justice, and we really have to take advantage of those. We can go to, unless anyone else can wants to chime in on that. Uh, this is John. I just want to uh, totally agree with you, Jared, that, you know, yes, the client may have legal issues, but, you know, the, especially coming from the stance of a health department, you know, if their, their legal issue is notwithstanding, you know, if they have substitutes or co-occurring uh, issues, they need help. They need, uh, or at least may, may, may make it available to them. And, um, you know, incarceration alone doesn't solve the problem. And I just want to resonate with that. And, and this plan is to see where those gaps are and check in with you folks out there in the community. Um, there may be some activities that we should be doing that we're not doing. And part of this experience here is for the for 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 agencies like the my division and working in tandem with Jared's division and other sister agencies to learn what's going on out there. Well, you know, what other good substance use uh, treatment prevention projects you're doing that are either not funded by us or privately funded or, you know, and make us aware of them and so that we can better synchronize, coordinate our efforts so that we're not duplicating efforts and perhaps even to the point where we can reinforce one another and uh, get the help, the services available for those that need it, whether or not they have legal issues or tied up with them. Yeah, this is Jared Ura. One of the things that I wanted to comment, which has really been heartening to me, as I've attended more workshops, what I have seen is professionals from both what I would call the law enforcement side, really, and treatment side and prevention side, attending the same workshops together in order to talk about essentially how to work together. So not only have there been presentations, um, I know when I've attended the American Association for Treatment of Opioid Dependence uh, meetings, which take place every year and a half, part of when you work with individuals who need to be prescribed opioids um, regulated, 
uh, for treatment and for recovery, the presentations have involved uh, members of law enforcement. And so there's been an opportunity for us to learn on the law enforcement side of uh, what's involved, whether we're talking a uh, drug enforcement agency, whether we're talking um, local law enforcement within a particular state, and an often opportunity as well for those on the law enforcement side also to hear from the treatment folks. I think as long as we begin to have trainings together and begin to network together, I think this is going to be able to build how we are able to work and create the system that we want in serving the consumers that we have. And the other thing uh, just I would like to uh, uh, stress is that, you know, regarding substance use and criminal justice, um, we're aware that there may be some gaps where there is a need for a warm handoff where the warm handoff doesn't exist. A good example, of course, is, is uh, for our offenders who are leaving jail or prison and re-entering the community. Do they have someone there to help them get them re-acclimated re uh, or, or can provide that jump start? Anyone who provides that sort of service uh, is essential at this point. And um, I just wanna give a shout out to those of you who are doing that, who are in the audience. We hope to identify some more of those opportunities, gaps, which are opportunities for warm handoffs to occur and to try to um, see what we can do to meet that rise to the challenge. Uh, thank you so much to our, our panel. Um, before I, I let them move on, I'd just like to draw their attention to our questions and answers window. Uh, we have, I think, maybe four open questions. Uh, some of those are re regarding the data um, and the data sources. Um, maybe we'll start with Kathy's question. Is there a reason why the unknown numbers are so high? Um, she says, I'm thinking that the probation numbers are higher for treatment referrals. Um, I think this is re uh, referencing the TED's graph. Um, does anyone on, our, anyone on our panel be able to, to provide some answers? Um, and then we do need to move on eventually if our panelists can maybe type the answer out for, the, for um, some of our participants here who have asked questions. That would be great. Um, Dev, I think Kathy's question on the unknowns is, refer is a reference to the slide from the crime in Hawaii, where it talks, you know, the unknown is, is uh, this, this unknown category is a code under the National Incident Based Reporting System. So it may have a function to do with, you know, if, 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 the, if the adult is being arrested for alcohol related part two, you know, are they checking? Because it seems to imply that they're not, or they, or they don't know, or, you know, uh, perhaps they're so focused on correcting the offense that, that for whatever reason, uh, certain individuals appear. So maybe we can take a look at that further dig into that some more because it does seem to suggest significant underreporting of ethnicities. Thank you, John. Does anyone else on our uh, panel want to weigh in on some of these questions? I'm reviewing all of the questions that we have right now. Um, in particular, Jane's questions, uh, type of data, which may be useful for examining violent crimes, including involving firearms with substance use, um, which is an excellent question. And um, her other question was, would it be feasible to have a cross-agency platform for data sharing, which allows tracking of individuals that may be more often cycling through multiple systems? I think uh, to respond to Jane's question, um, 
the 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 latter question about the data sharing platform uh, that's something that an initiative we're trying to where it's already sort of underway for the for the behavioral health administration within health uh, where there's this idea of trying to develop some sort of uh, master patient index, which could be uh, where we could look to see if a user has been or a client has what sorts of services have been um, uh, they've received across not just alcohol and drugs, but other uh, behavioral health divisions. Um, that's something that we're, we're, we're trying to see whether we can put together. There are some, you know, data structural issues plus the 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 legal issues you know especially with the you know the need to obtain consents around the sharing of the data because there there's several bodies of confidentiality laws that we have to abide by but um that sort of initiative is somewhat in the works Great. Thank you, John, for uh, those responses, and thank you for to our panel. I I see that there are a lot more uh, questions that have popped up in the questions and answers um, window. Um, if you if our panel could try to type out a question uh, an answer for them, that would be great. Um, just to say that we have answered those, um, or at least attempted to. Unfortunately, we do have a time limit and we um, will be moving on to our uh, next section uh, shortly. Uh, would that be okay? Yep. Great. Sure, maybe we so can make a, make a note of these questions and then uh, and get a reply later. Yep, that is also a possibility. We are uh, going to be compiling all of the feedback uh, that we get from all of the chat and the, and the questions. Um, and that goes into our feedback for the general uh, webinar. So thank you so much for all of your questions. Uh, we will try to answer them as, as, as good as we can. Um, okay, so I am going to go ahead and move us over uh, to our uh, next uh, section of the presentation, which is looking at the chapter seven of the statistical report on the intersection of substance use and juvenile justice. Um, so to start off this uh, half of our presentation, we have our first, our third poll question, excuse me, um, which is how familiar are you with juvenile justice issues in the state? Again, I will um, give everyone a few moments to provide your answer to that multiple choice question. Thank you so much. Um, and our fourth poll question, again, is very similar to question number two. Are you directly involved with providing juvenile justice services? Um, we'll give you a few moments to answer those questions as well. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, so, Again, before I pass it over to our presenter, um, I would like to give a short overview of this chapter. So chapter seven has only one subsection looking at the intersection between juvenile justice, um, substance use and crime and violence. Although this chapter could be viewed as a subset of the previous chapter, I think having it uh, as a standalone chapter shows how important the emerging adult and adolescent age group is for the overall system of care plan in Hawaii. The data used for this chapter comes from the crime and Hawaii reports, which again are part of the uniform crime reports program. I have already gone over this data source in the previous section, but one thing I would like to note is that one of the challenges challenges of this chapter is that not much data is collected about this age group. 
in particular, which is fairly evident here. Um, the next slide goes over some of which um, I outlined earlier in terms of the limitations. But again, if you want more detailed information about each data set, please refer to the appendix of the report itself. And now I will be passing it over to Jacqueline to take us through the highlights of this section. The figures on this slide and the following slides give an overview of the data we have in Chapter 7 of the Statistical Report, which covers substance use and juvenile justice. The data presented in these graphs were extracted from the 2019 Crime in Hawaii report. These graphs are also very similar to the graphs in the criminal justice chapter, but these graphs focus on juvenile arrests. This graph presents the number of juvenile arrests for substance-related offenses in the state of Hawaii for the years 2010 to 2019. The graph gives a total number of arrests arrest for each year for alcohol-related offenses, drug manufacturing and sale offenses, and drug possession offenses. The number of arrests range from zero to about 500 arrests. In Hawaii, over the years 2010 to 2019, the possession of marijuana was the most common substance-related offense among juvenile arrests. Overall, the number of juvenile arrests for the possession of marijuana seemed to be decreasing. Again, these counts represent the number of arrests and not the number of individuals. Next slide, please. This graph shows the number of juvenile arrests for alcohol-related offenses in the state of Hawaii for the year 2019. It breaks down the number of juvenile arrests by age group in years and by sex. The alcohol-related offenses include disorderly conduct, driving under the influence, and liquor laws. In 2019, the number of juvenile arrests for alcohol-related offenses in Hawaii were the highest among males who were aged 17 years old. The most common alcohol-related offenses among juveniles were liquor laws and disorderly conduct. Next slide, please. This graph also looks at the number of juvenile arrests by age and sex. It specifically looks at drug possession offenses for the year 2019. The drug possession offenses are broken down by substance categories, which are marijuana, opium or cocaine, synthetic narcotic, and non-narcotic substances. In 2019, marijuana was the most common substance for drug possession offenses among juvenile arrests for all age groups for both sexes. Next slide, please. This graph just shows the number of juvenile arrests for alcohol-related offenses in Hawaii for the year 2019 by race and ethnicity. Again, the alcohol-related offenses are disorderly conduct, DUIs, and liquor laws. In 2019, the number of juvenile arrests for alcohol-related offenses were higher among juveniles whose ethnicity were unknown and juveniles whose ethnicity were Hawaiian or white. Again, the most common Alcohol-related offenses were liquor laws and disorderly conduct. Next slide, please. This graph looks at the number of juvenile arrests specifically for drug possession offenses in 2019. Like the previous graph, it breaks down the number of arrests by race and ethnicity. Again, the drug possession offenses are broken down into marijuana, opium or cocaine, synthetic narcotic, and non-narcotic substances. In 2019, the number of juvenile arrests for drug possession offenses were higher among juveniles whose ethnicity were Hawaiian or white. And again, marijuana was the most common substance for drug possession offenses among juvenile arrests. And this is the last graph for this chapter, and I'll pass it back to Dr. Tolan. Thank you so much, Jacqueline. Uh, again, we are now at the discussion portion of our presentation, and we have roughly about uh, 10 minutes or so. Uh, again, as we go through our discussion questions, please feel free to add your own answers and comments in the chat window. I see we have 
uh, more questions popping up in the questions and answers um, window. Um, although the subject matter expert for this chapter, Dr. Diane Miao, could not make it today, she did provide uh, some feedback to these questions and um, I will let our panel incorporate them into the discussion as we go along. Um, again, maybe we can start off with uh, our first discussion question before moving on to the questions and answers in the um, window. So the first question is, given your experience in the subject matter, what are some key highlights on the intersection of substance use and juvenile justice that you would like to share with the audience? So I will pass this over now to our uh, panel. I think it's uh, maybe Jared can start us off with our discussion uh, and John and um, Dr. Euro can, can follow. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Okay, thanks again. So, you know, again, really one of the most demonstrative things that I see with this, these infographics are that you know, there's a really small amount of youths that are involved in the justice system. So given that small amount or smaller amount, it seems like we should be able to manage this issue of juvenile involved um, justice involved juveniles and, and substance abuse a lot more better. It's really, again, an opportunity for us to, to harness that, to be able to look at um, what we can do and, and really manage these issues better. Um, I think overall what we saw, again, um, just in terms of, um, you know, what drugs these juveniles are mostly involved with, we can see almost immediately um, kids are involved with marijuana a lot. And that's not surprising. Um, there's probably, um, you know, we see male versus female, and we see some of the ethnicities that are uh, represented there. Um, you know, number one, um, I, I think culturally in Hawaii, there's um, some cultural acceptance of it or community acceptance of, of marijuana versus other drugs. You know, I, I can't tell you in my career how many times I've heard parents tell me, well, better my kids smoke marijuana than um, use harder drugs. We see something like that. We're almost normalizing this or normalizing drugs um, better uh, or, or seem to be normalizing drugs like that, um, that type of phenomenon in our community. So we, we see a lot of that. But again, I, I just want to say that really what these infographics tell us is that there's opportunity and there's opportunity even for us in law enforcement um, uh, to, to be able to be part of the solution on this. Um, you know, I, I did see some of the, the unknown um, data here in the infographics, and some of that also is um, part of the process in law enforcement. When, when we arrest someone, arrest is the point of entry into either the juvenile justice or the criminal justice system uh, many times. And part of that is actually doing the paperwork. And I can say just overwhelmingly in my experience that um, we as officers don't always do a good job of completing the paperwork. Certainly we do ask what ethnicity people are, but often um, in the rush to get all the paperwork done, we, sur we surpass or bypass some of the questions. So it could really just be something as granular as we're not collecting all the information we're supposed to. And I'll um, let my colleagues also chime in on this. Jared, I'll let uh, Dr. Euro uh, let you go first. Any thoughts? Okay. I'm actually looking at Michelle Rogers' question, which I think, um, you know, ties in. Um, I'm looking at, you know, what is in place for juveniles that are being arrested and so I think when we're really looking at how to address, you know, juveniles that are arrested for alcohol and other offenses, what supports being offered to help those not become addicts or habitual offenders. I mean, the idea is if they do become arrested, we really don't want it to happen more than once. Uh, we'd ideally like to see it not happen at all. Uh, but if they do become involved, what, what are the current options? So um, I do know we have a couple of folks who are here um, who potentially can answer. So I know Colleen Fox saw Greg, ja Greg Japkis. I'll certainly give my um, 
opinion because I do have a background working with adolescents and families, uh, but I'd also like to be able, and then Lisa Blair, because I know you also have uh, some things with uh, prevention that you're doing for city and county. Uh, my experience has been a lot of it has to do with youth and structure. And for many of the youth, and this is what the research has shown that for many of the youth that do become involved, often it's because they're missing things that are, are involved with youth that do not offend or ideally are not using substances, having things place, the activities, the family, the support, the things that keep the structure. So essentially they're less likely to become involved either in using drugs and less likely to become arrested. Um, this is more the prevention side of the shop, which I have to admit, I do not know as well as the prevention people do. I do have an understanding though of what are called risk and protective factors. And I do know that protective, protective factors related to structured and appropriate social activities um, are those things which are ultimately going to keep you from getting involved in the criminal justice system, as well as in drug use. Um, I do invite those, some of our folks who do provide services to youth also to answer because I've been fortunate throughout the years to visit their programs, also to meet with some of the youth who receive services and the work that they do is really excellent. So either Colleen, uh, Greg or Lisa or anyone else, if you'd like to also respond to this. Thank you, Dr. J. Um, the, I believe some of the things that are um, um, the, the author of the juvenile justice chapter who couldn't be here regretfully today, but uh, she made some observations. And um, one is that, you know, they, those the youth who are involved in the justice system are frequently engaged in substance use, whether or not, even if even if they're, they're not charged with a drug-related offense. Um, another idea that she floated was the idea of some sort of uh, screening that's done more universally. The idea is that, you know, and I don't know, it, well, curious to see what you think, but if we engage in, the idea is that if we engage in some sort of universal screening for substance use or other you know, behavioral health risks in the schools or community-based settings, then possibly we could prevent um, youth from being uh, involved in the criminal justice system and possibly connected to care earlier. Um, but they also, she also highlighted that, you know, you know youth have, have that have, oh, that she also highlighted some sort of investment in community-based or culturally grounded care that uh, could connect youth to caring adults um, uh, that they could relate to, whether or not it's their family, but you know, some caring adult uh, possibly to help reduce some racial and ethnic disparities that we see, you know, uh, particularly around where you know Native Hawaiians tend to be over overrepresented in the arrests. So perhaps more programming or more services along those lines with some of her suggestions. Dev or Jared R, back to you. Yeah, I think um, what also one of the, the important things that we probably haven't discussed yet with both adult and juvenile justice is to look at diversion programs early on. Um, you know, traditionally, to get some of the protective services of the justice system, you first got to get arrested. Then the courts can force you or probation and parole can force you to go into some sort of treatment or to get some sort of screenings or assessment and those kinds of things. Um, that's particularly true traditionally of even the juvenile justice system where you know, we as law enforcement officers um, traditionally relied on these ideas that under 18, 
you got to arrest them and bring them in. Um, you, you know, you, we don't have some um, a lot of good options on the street, but really diversion, you know, like so that they don't get arrested and, and what law enforcement's place is to help divert away is something that I think also has to be improved upon um, so that I, I don't have to rely on the traditional, somewhat archaic um, things that I uh, that we normally had to do before, which is arrest them to get them in. So if we can do things to get people away and diverted uh, from entry into the justice system, you know, with community-based services, um, improvements in the family setting and those kinds of things are probably um, just as or more valuable than arrest, punishment, and then getting the protective services of the justice system. Great, thank you. Um, there, Lisa Blair, you have your hand raised. Uh, if you wanna, if someone could unmute. Um, I'm not sure we can unmute her, but uh, if she has a question, she can put it in the question and answers window. Since she is an attendee, not a panelist. Um, I think um, Valerie Mariano posted a, a link to the juvenile justice, juvenile criminal justice flowcharts on their website. Um, I think that was in response to a question by Michelle. Um, and there has been a couple other comments in the chat window. Um, unfortunately, we are at three minutes to the top of the hour. And the discussion has been great. We've had a lot of questions. Um, and thank you so much for um, all of the participation. Um, I'm going to open it up to the panelists to have uh, if they have any final thoughts um, before we move on. Dr. I think for, I think for ahead, me. Sorry. Yeah, uh, it's there. There's lots of challenges, but these challenges and we like to view them as opportunities. But you know, um, our small agency <laughs> that's part of a big department can't do it. Uh, can't do it all, um, and we really um, continue to uh, work and try to uh, resource and do what we can to support our our direct service providers. Uh, some of many of which are here today. So um, again, shout out to all of you. Thank you all for what you do. Um, but let, yeah, let's continue to move forward together and try to create these, um, meet these gaps wherever they appear. Yeah, I wanted to acknowledge the comments that I saw in the chat box that came in from Colleen and Greg and also Lisa. Um, I think for those of you who are working with use, whether it be uh, they or whether it be others, uh, the importance of really involvement, not only with the youth, but ideally with the family is really important. And a number of you know that my background is marriage and family psychology. Um, it does have a lot to do with not only supporting the youth, but also su supporting the family and in particular the parents so that they can support the youth. Um, when those activities happen, those are the things that ultimately are gonna help the youth as well. So activities that support the family structure are really key, I believe in really helping to protect youth and prevent them from becoming rearrested if they become arrested and ultimately really to prevent them from becoming addicted if they are on the path to becoming addicted. So I do appreciate very much the comments and thanks everyone for the discussion that we've had today. And I just would like to add one more thing. Um, yeah, we, we, while while there's a, there are some treatment based uh, programs that are out there, um, we'd also be very interested in looking at how to expand prevention services to this population. So that I'm sure is another set of conversations. Um, uh, Jared Rudilla, any last words? 
Yeah, I'd just like to uh, thank everybody uh, again. I think I think the, there's, there are some challenges for us here in working in the criminal justice realm, but I also think that, again, um, we can harness opportunity and, and hopefully do that to make people better, to make our children better, and ultimately the community better. So thanks, everybody. Okay, thank you so much to our panelists. Um, and we are now at the conclusion of our webinar. Before we let you go, uh, we just wanted to remind you that we do have three other webinars coming up, um, one on the 17th, the 24th, and the 1st. So they're gonna be back to back on Friday. We are taking a break um, next week, and so we'll resume the week after. Um, please do join us for those uh, if you have not signed up for it. Um, as we mentioned, we have all of our contact information here. We're going to be distributing with uh, the, the slides and as well as the links here. We'll, we'll be coming out with the slides. Um, and finally, please do uh, consider signing or filling out our uh, a short post webinar survey it would really help us um, with the final three um, webinars. Um, and again, thank you so much, our panelists. Thank you so much for uh, all of our, uh, our audience, who our attendees, who had great discussion today. You guys were, were great. We had lots of questions. Thank you so much uh, for your time, and we hope to see you at the next webinar. Aloha, and have a great rest of your Friday. Mahalo. Thank you, everyone.